Bible study for this week. Uh, this week we're going to try, I'm going to do something different. Since we started the book of Hebrews, we've kind of divided the, each chapter into two weeks. I'm going to try to do the whole chapter 7 tonight. Uh, the reason for it is some of what we are going to consider, we've already talked about in the last couple of weeks. Remember I, I mentioned that I felt like Melchizedek may have been uh, what we would call a, uh, a theophany, that is God appearing in the form of man. It happened several times in the Old Testament. Uh, and I felt like that's what Melchizedek may have been with, uh, uh, with the incident involving Abraham. Well, tonight, the Hebrew writer in the entire chapter 7, he, in my opinion, he spells it out very clearly. And this is the evidence that I feel we have to say that Melchizedek could have been a theophany, that is, God appearing in the form of a man. Uh, and he spells this out pretty clearly. Now, if, if it's not that, it's almost impossible to understand or interpret what was meant in chapter 7 by, of, the, of the book of Hebrews. Uh, it's clearly evident that the writer of Hebrews may have felt this or, or, or did feel this way. And since we've already talked about this and we already know what the conclusion of the matter is, I'm going to try to go through this whole chapter <laughs> And lay it out step by step, the evidence that we have of this. Um, in Hebrews chapter 7, it's first observed. I'm going to give a, a, a kind of a review before we read it. it it's uh, first observed here uh, that we're talking about Melchizedek, and we have to go back to Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, to see where this was first brought out. Before we do so, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to study your word. We know your word can get deep. Your word is very rich. Uh, and when we take advantage of it, and when we really try to study it and understand it, your word becomes alive, and it is more powerful than we can even imagine. We pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that you help us. We pray, Father, that in a mighty way you will direct our, our, our understanding, that you will guide us in what we need to know, what we should know, and that you will indeed help us and bless us in, in many, many ways. Father, we just pray for an anointing over this spirit, uh, over the spirit and the anointing to be over this study, and we pray, Father, for, for you to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. In Hebrews chapter 7, we're beginning here talking about the priestly orders of Levi versus Melchizedek. A contrast between the Aaronic priesthood and the priesthood of Christ, which is the order of Melchizedek. As you noted in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6, the Hebrew writer quoted from Psalm 110 verse 4, where God made an oath. That, that basically Jesus would serve forever in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, again, that's quoting Psalm 110. Now what's interesting to note is David, when he quoted this, the Aaronic priest was in full operation. The, the Levite priest was in full operation. So it's very interesting to note that even David was pinpointing that there would be something future that would transcend what was existing at that time. That the Aaronic priesthood or the Levitical priesthood, that it would not last forever. That it would eventually transcend into something better. Um, there was no Aaronic priest that uh, was a priest forever. Why? What, what, what would be the main reason why? Well, what happened to the priest uh, in the Aaron line? Eventually they, they died. The son took over, right? The, the son would then take over, uh, and, and that's exactly what happened. Now in chapter 7, as we get in here, the writer's making it very clear that the priest does not hold the position by succession. 
But the fact is that this priest has eternal life. It's not succession. He's not getting it from someone else. It is something, it's a priest that never dies, unlike the Aaronic priest, priesthood. And the priesthood, of course, is from a different order. Uh, this priesthood, this priesthood of Melchizedek, is a non-Jewish priesthood. Uh, it, is, it did not come from any of, of the Jews, primarily for the simple fact that when Melchizedek appeared to Abraham, guess what? The Jews were not a people yet. The Jews descended from Abraham. They became a nation or a race from Abraham. Uh, Abraham, uh, when, he, when, when Melchizedek appeared to Abraham, Abraham did not have uh, uh, any, any children. There was no lineage yet. So... This, for lack of a better word, you know, the word Gentile means non-Jew, right? It's interesting to note that if Melchizedek was, was, was a real man, then he would be of a, a Gentile descent. He, he wasn't of Jewish descent. And so uh, that, that's an interesting fact to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, this Melchizedek priesthood is universal. It's totally independent. Now, we're going to see as we go into verse 12 that this priesthood has not, or I should say, it has changed. The Aaronic priesthood changed. Um, if the priesthood has changed, then what else has changed? The law has changed, the Mosaic law. So there Melchizedek, being not that, that he was not a Jew, he was a contemporary of Abraham, and, and there were no Jews in the days of Abraham. Abraham was... Uh, the man who the lineage later gave vice to the to the Jewish people, and this writer of Hebrews makes a very intriguing argument. Now the question is, who is Melchizedek? We kind of discussed this briefly in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there's basically three different classes or schools of thought on this. Uh, there are. I guess you could say two Christian views and one Jewish view. The two Christian views, which is the most common today, the first one is that uh, basically Melchizedek was just simply a man. He was the king of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem means city of Salem. Salem means shalom. What, what do we, when we say shalom, what does that mean? Peace. City of peace. Now, when you go back to the Genesis chapter 14, this, this, this city was called the city of Shalom. Uh, Abraham lived at a time when there was no organized religion. Okay? That uh, God had not established an organized religion. In Abraham's day, people built their own altars. They made their own sacrifices uh, they didn't need a priest. Uh, basically, this holy place, personnel, altars, all these things got trapped under the religious systems that developed. But in Abraham's day, there was no need of a priest because you built your own altar and you made your own sacrifices to God. You did that independently. So the question again is, if Melchizedek was a priest, then under what religious order or religious system was he a priest? So each tribe did their own. Well, there was different. There, basically, there wasn't. There was no tribes of Israel then, because Israel was not existing. But own people had their own way of worshiping what they thought was God. Some of it was false gods. Some of it, well, they worshipped statues and they they worshipped uh, Baal. They worshipped false images that they thought was Almighty God. But there was no religious order of worship to the true God. There was no organized religion at this time. And so based on what people thought, remember, Abel was, he, he understood that to worship God you needed to make a sacrifice. So he, he built an altar and he gave up the first fruits of his, of, of his, of his flock. And there were people who continued to follow that, mo that model, 
that wanted to serve what they thought was the true God and who was the true God. And so there were people throughout the ages that, 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 that still did that. And Abraham, of course, uh, no doubt, if, 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 if he worshipped the true God, which he did, he, he had his own altar and he made up his own sacrifices. It wasn't until about 400 years later that God established a priesthood. He established a, a religious order where there were priests that did this for the people. And, and like I said, that was 400, 430 years later. So... And there was kings. There, there were kings of different nations, yes. But of course, Israel was not developed into a nation yet. The Israelites, the children of Abraham, had not uh, been born yet. Uh, and they had, of course, not been put into captivity. They didn't become a nation, really, until after they left Egypt as slaves. That's when God established them order. He established them a religious order. And they began, and from there came the kings and the judges and the order that they had. Exactly. Right. And that all came many years later. So this is, this is pre-Israel, okay? And what happened was, in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham is coming back from some type of military campaign. You know what kind of campaign it was? His, no, his nephew Lot had been kidnapped. The pagan kings were fighting amongst themselves. And in the process of that, which had nothing to do with Lot or Abraham, Lot gets kidnapped. So because his nephew got basically kidnapped, Abraham made it his battle. He went in and he fought to save his nephew and to get his nephew out of captivity. And he succeeded. And in the process of coming back, of course, he had... Any time you fought anybody in war... What did you take? The spoils of it. Your enemies, you took their spoils. If they had gold, if they had uh, 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 herbs and spices, if they had clothes, if they had swords, whatever, their horses, you know, you took anything. After, if you won the war, you got to take the spoils. And so Abraham's coming back after successfully retrieving his nephew, and he's got all these spoils. And he encounters this, this man, what appears to be a man, who is the king and a priest. And that's unusual. Very unusual. Especially when we get into this, you'll find out how unusual it was. And, and, and so Abraham, he recognized this, this person as being superior to him because the first thing this priest did was he blessed Abraham. How so? He brought out wine and bread to Abraham. That's a blessing. So Abraham allowed this king priest to bless him. And after receiving the blessing, blessing, Abraham gave ten, a tenth, a tithe, of the spoils he had just retrieved when he retrieved his nephew. The, one, the ones he had taken, the, the spoils. So he gives an offering to the priest. Now, the interesting thing about this whole story is before this happened, no one ever knew who Melchizedek was. Then this happens, and then guess what? Melchizedek disappears. We never know anything more about Melchizedek until thousands of years later when the Hebrew writer decides to tell us some things. That's the mystery behind Melchizedek. There's no lineage of who, where he came from. There's no lineage of when, or, or there's no records of when he died, when he was, when he, you know, when he was born, when he died. There's no, there's no records of who, who his children were. Who, how did he get his position as a king and priest? And then who, who received it after he, you know? There's nothing. Okay. Now the common thread in most commentators is that this was a man. Well, if it was a man, I think we would know more about this individual. I think there would be more evidence that he existed. I think he would have came up more than just two different places. Actually, he came up three times in the Bible. 
in Genesis 14, very briefly, there's a, a quick story of what Abraham did with him. Then David mentions it in Psalm that our king, our Messiah, would be uh, a king and priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And then finally, in Hebrews, there's a whole chapter devoted to who this fellow, what, what, what he represents, who he is. Now, I don't understand how people can read Hebrews chapter 7 and come to any other conclusion than the conclusion that I have come to. And how they can still say he was some kind of Canaanite prince who was a believer in God and Abraham recognized that. Now, the, the, the other Christian explanation of who he was was he was, it was a uh, theophany, which is... God appearing as a, as, a, as a human, which that happened in the Old Testament. Um, it happened with Joshua. Uh, there, it, 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 there it, it speaks of how uh, the, the one who was over the angels appeared to him and appeared to him like an angel or as a, as a man. Okay? It happened to Abraham even later in, in Genesis chapter 18. When the it says there that Yahweh came to him in, in the Genesis, and then it, it, there was three messengers that they were in the form of the three men. Okay, um, it says there uh, Jacob wrestled with what we say an angel, but when ja when when Jacob asked him what his name was, he said basically his name was Wonderful. Well, in Isaiah nine six. Jesus was called what? And his name shall be called Wonderful, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, right? So there, there were cases in the Bible where we have a, um, a, 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 the, a, a theophany, and that is God appearing in the form of man. And... There's a very good evidence if you study Hebrews chapter 7 and look at it close enough that that's what we had in the case of Melchizedek. But for some reason, there's some scholars who can't accept it because of some verbiage that I don't think they're paying attention to. Mm -hmm. The other view, the Jewish view of who Melchizedek was, is they thought it was Shem, the son of Noah. Because at the time that this happened, that Abraham went and rescued Lot, guess what? Shem was still alive. He was almost over 500 years old. He was the oldest man alive on earth because what happened with the flood? Shem, the, the three sons of Noah, survived the flood, right? And Noah, of course, later died. Japheth died. Ham died. Shem was the only one still alive. He was the oldest man on earth. And because he did get on the ark with daddy, he was a worshiper of, of the true God, right? And so he was considered with a, a lot of, uh, of, of, of respect. He was considered with a lot of admiration by the Jews. And they want to think that perhaps since he is a, you could say a, a, a father of Abraham, because that would have been Abraham's, <laughs> you know, great 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 grandfather or, or something, uh, ancestor of some sort. Um, they they want to think that it was Shem. The only problem I have with that interpretation, or with that uh, with that, I will say it's a good guess. It may it, it could make a lot of sense, but the only problem I have with it is. The Hebrew writer specifically mentioned Shem a couple of chapters ago. He mentioned him by name. Why, was, why would there be a name to change his name? Why would there be a point in changing his name? Uh, and even in the Genesis account, why would there be any need to change Melchizedek's name if you're talking about Shem? Why would, why would his name change? That, that doesn't... That just doesn't come together. It doesn't make it doesn't make sense. We're going to examine later what Melchizedek means, uh, but uh, there again, when you begin to when we begin to tear this chapter apart, you'll 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 see very clearly that it has to be somebody greater than Shem. Okay.
Uh, is there any other notes I would like to bring up? Uh, Jewish view. Um, I don't think there's much more I can uh, get into here. Um, I will say this before we start. Just as a, as a, I guess you could say as a precursor. Um, in verse number four. In the very beginning it says, Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Do you remember in our last few weeks of studying Hebrews, what has been one of the themes of Hebrews? Christ is greater. Christ is better. Right? Christ was greater than the angels. They were, the angels were great, but Christ was greater. Christ was greater than Moses. Okay? Christ was greater than Joshua. We kept on going through, the Hebrew writer kept saying, Christ is, you know, this is okay, but Christ is greater. Christ is better. Now, now we're getting to this priest that really even to the Jews, they, they understood the story, but the Jews didn't really know Melchizedek. The Jews really didn't. Melchizedek was not one of these Old Testament people that everybody just knew like David or Abraham or Moses or, you know. So here we get, we're talking about a mystery man that doesn't have a genealogy attached to him. And then the Hebrew writer wants to now get into verse 4 by saying how great this man was. Hmm. Now, it seems like either the Hebrew writer is completely changing his flow of argument, or perhaps if Melchizedek was the pre-incarnated Jesus, perhaps he's talking about Jesus. Of course, he wouldn't be called Jesus at that point, because Jesus didn't take on that name until he was incarnated and came to earth. He was the Word. You know, the Father, Son, and the Word of the Trinity. Uh, so, it's kind of interesting when you study context and you look at everything we thus far have studied, it doesn't really make sense for, for the Hebrew writer to take a whole chapter and talk about a man that hardly very few people knew that much about if he was just a man. And then talk about how great this man was. When everything before this point was Christ is greater, Christ is greater, Christ is greater. And so when you look at it from that point of view, again, I think it goes along with, 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 with kind of the direction that I have gone in saying that Melchizedek was actually a theophany. Okay, um, now there is one point I will bring up before we start reading that I want to bring up, and that is in verse 3, there's one point here, and I think this is why a lot of Bible commentators will not give credit to Melchizedek being a theophany because of this one thing stated. And I'm going to explain it, and then as we read this, it'll all come together for us. It says here, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made, notice this, like the Son of God. Well, they say if He is the Son of God, how He's, he, you know, he, 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 how can He be a type of Christ if He is Christ? And then because it says, if, but made like the Son of God, that clearly indicates that no, He can't be Jesus because it's, He said here He's made like the Son of God. Well, first of all, to understand this, you've got to realize when did Jesus take on the title Son of God? Was Jesus called Son of God in heaven before He came to earth? He was the Word. It was only when, when the angel appeared to Mary and she said, you, He will be called Son of God. Right? You'll name Him Jesus and He will be called Son of God. He didn't take on that title until He was incarnate. So, basically what He's saying is Melchizedek, Melchizedek is like the incarnate Jesus. 
Just like every other time that we had a theophany where God appeared, it was like the Son of God. It was like that. So you can't use that statement to sit here and say, well, you know, they've they got to be two different people because it says he was made like the Son of God. No, basically it's just saying he was like Jesus incarnate before Jesus became Jesus incarnate. He came in the form of a man. Now, yes, he didn't come through a virgin birth. He didn't come through the way that the incarnate Jesus did. He appeared from heaven in this form, in this way, and it was appeared that he was a man. It appeared he's a king. He, he's, a, he's a priest. He appeared in this, in this way, and then, of course, he took care of business. He did exactly what, what a king or a priest would do. He blessed Abraham, and then in turn, Abraham made an offering to him. And so it, it just shows you, uh, you know, you just gotta, you gotta understand verbiage, you gotta understand expressions, context, you gotta look at the whole book of Hebrews to understand chapter 7. Now, now that we've got all that out of the way, now that we've got all that good juice that we just soaked up, let's start reading this, and we're going to break it down into verses. I'm not going to read the whole, the whole thing at a time. We'll just read a, a verse here or there. We'll stop. We'll explain some. But we're going to read this whole chapter because this, I believe, this is the evidence. The Bible itself, Hebrews chapter 7, is the evidence we have that Melchizedek, Melchizedek was uh, uh, a, a theophany, that he was a pre- incarnation of Jesus. Okay? Let's look at chapter 7. Let's first of all uh, read verses 1. I, I, Pi, would you... Oh, you, you're... Okay. We'll read verse ch verse 1. Can you see, Carol? Not good. Not good. Okay, I'll read. Verse 1, and we'll read the first sentence of verse 2. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Like first, huh? That's what you said. Right. I'm reading it right here from Hebrews. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Now, I think it's interesting here, the... The, the writer is basically summarizing everything that was in Genesis chapter 14. It's very brief. This whole story of Melchizedek and Abraham was a brief story. Oh, it was a powerful story. There was a lot of stuff in that story, but it was a brief story. And basically in this one verse or two verses, <laughs> the Hebrew writer summarized the whole story. Okay? And it's interesting. It says here, uh, he was. It mentions that Melchizedek was a king of Salem. It mentions he was a priest. He met Abraham. He blessed Abraham, and Abraham gave him a tithe. Okay, very very simple to the point. And and there in verse uh, two, it says here that he first that first being translated king of righteousness. That is what Melchizedek translates to mean, king of righteousness. And then it says, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So basically what Melchizedek means here, the writer is giving us a clue. Now most commentators think that king of Salem means king of Jerusalem. But no, king of Salem does not mean king of Jerusalem. King of Salem means king of peace. Okay, yeah, they say, well, Shalom, well, that, because... Jerusalem was a was you know the, a place of peace. Well, you got to remember, Jerusalem was just another Canaanite city before the Israelites took it. Jerusalem was a wicked place. There was no peace, and I don't think that there would be a king of righteousness who was great and so fear inspiring that would have a wicked city. Normally, a king of Righteousness would have a city of righteousness, right? Well, at the time that Abraham met up with this king, 
Jerusalem was not a part of Israel. It was not a place of peace. So basically, you got this righteous king, and he's also a king of peace, and he's in Jerusalem. That was not righteous, and that was not peaceful. So, in my understanding of this, I would have to say that this, even though he's a king of Salem, he's a king of peace, and he's a king of righteousness, I can't think of any other expression that you would give anybody in the universe except Jesus. King of righteousness, king of peace. I can't think of any other. And so I think right there in the very second verse, we already got get an idea or a clue who Melchizedek is. Because who else on the face of the earth would deem such appropriate titles? Now, let's look at verse 3. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now hold up! The last thing I just read was remains a priest continually. Wait a minute. This means that when the Hebrew writer wrote it, if Melchizedek was a man, he would still be living. Because it says here that he remains a priest continually. Was there anybody in the Bible that lived over two or three thousand years? No. <laughs> Methuselah was the oldest man that's recorded in the Bible to have lived, and that was what, 968 years, I think, if I remember correctly? So, no. So, we're already beginning to see very early in this chapter, hey, this is talking about somebody else. This isn't just a man. And it says here, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, this person's eternal. This person is somebody who does not, who has not died. And it says here, he is pre and he remains a, he remains a priest continually. Now, we already addressed what this being like the Son of God meant. It didn't mean he was separate than the Son of God. It just simply meant he was like the incarnate Jesus when Jesus did come and everybody knew it was Jesus. That's what it meant. And so I, we can already see just in those these first three verses who, who we must be talking about. Uh, verses 4 through 7. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Again, how great he is. Before... The writer was saying everybody else was, was less and Jesus was greater. And now he's given all this the, these props to, to, to Melchizedek. Oh, he, look how great he was. I think what it is is the Hebrew writer didn't change his tune. He's still talking about how great Jesus is. All right? And then it says here, And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment, to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. The Levites are less prestigious than Abraham. Why? Because they came from Abraham. They were descendants of Abraham. But they were, are the recipients of the tithes that Israel uh, was given in the Israel's religion. Now in verse 7, the writer is establishing that Melchizedek was superior than Abraham. So if the Le Levitical priesthood is inferior to Abraham and Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, then clearly Melchizedek is greater than any other <laughs> priesthood. <laughs> That's what was established in those few verses we just read. We'll look at verse 8. Here mortal, mortal men receive tithes. What does that mean? Mortal means that you're going to die. Immortal means you can't die. Mortal means you're going to die. And here it says they receive tithes, but there he receives them. 
of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Now here on earth under the Jewish system, these mortal Levites received their tithes. Now that right there tells you, it, it says this is in the present tense, so that the temple was still open. The st temple was still operating. The temple was still there, so this had to be before 70 A.D. And the temple had not yet been destroyed. But then it says, but there he receives them. But there, where? Where is there? Well, in the story of Genesis chapter 14... He received them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Hold on, I, I, I lost my place in my notes. Genesis 14 is the there part, okay? Let me, let me find my place here. Here mortal man receives tithes, but there, and there in Genesis chapter 14, where we got the story of Abraham and giving a tithe, uh, his offering to Melchizedek, he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Now, the interesting part about this, the witness that he lives, is the one who receives the tithes does not die. Melchizedek did not die. It appears he is saying that we have testimony from somewhere that Melchizedek lives. Where do we have that testimony? Genesis 14 and Psalm 110 does not show that he still lived. But so where 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 does is this testimony given that he still lives? Well, the biggest testimonies of the Christians in the first century and even today is what? Jesus lives. Our whole Christian faith is based on the fact that Jesus lives. Though he got killed, though he died on the cross, Jesus lives. He's alive. That's the true testimony. He from the dead. Yes, that is the testimony of the entire Christian faith. Jesus lives. And so I think again, this is referring to Jesus. Testimony that all those early Christians knew. Jesus lives. And that's what it's saying. Of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Verse 9. It says, Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in his loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, let's read verse, let me read that again. It says, Even Levi who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he who's still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Here it says, receives tithes. That's again present tense. The temple is still standing. If the Jewish priesthood is honored by paying tithes to the Levites, the Jewish priesthood pays tithes to Melchizedek because all the Levites were in Abraham's loins when he paid the tithes to Melchizedek. Those to whom the Jews paid tithes acknowledge his superiority to him in the person of Abraham doing it. So receiving the blessings and giving of the tithes Abraham recognized that Melchizedek was superior to him. What made him superior? This is why the Jews think it was Shem. Because they want to say it was somebody that was uh, that, that descended. That Shem, you know, Abraham descended from Shem. They wanted to keep it in their own little system. But no, that's not that was not the case here. There was no one else at that time, who would have been superior to Abraham in a physical sense other than Shem. But let's go back here to verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Okay. 
this is basically where we get into this thinking logically from Psalm 110 verse 4. The Aaronaic priesthood was, as I mentioned earlier, it was still in operation when David wrote Psalm 110 verse 4. So why did God, here's a question to consider, why did God through David speak of another priesthood? The writer was extrapolating from Psalm 110 that God was already hinting at something new and something better, something that would be permanent. It's basically establishing the fact that the priesthood of Aaron was never to be permanent. The whole system, the Mosaic law, the whole system was not to be a permanent arrangement. It was a shadow. It was to foreshadow something greater. And that, I think, is what David was establishing there in Psalm 110, verse 4. Um, the Aaronic priesthood would not be the ultimate priesthood. Verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, here we go again, of necessity, there's also a change of the law. Now, here's an interesting point. There's a group of, of religious people today called, called Messianics. Called what? Messianics. And today, um, they like to, to pinpoint, or, or they like to criticize something that Jesus said or, or they make a statement that Jesus made to say that we are still under the Mosaic Law. Jesus made a statement at Matthew chapter 5 verse 18 and 19. There he said, Do not think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. He said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. And so there's even Seventh-day Adventists today who will use that to say we're still under the Sabbath law because Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. So because they say he, he came not to destroy, they think that they, they're supposed to keep the entire law. They're supposed to eat the same dietary restrictions, uh, have the same dietary restrictions. They're supposed to follow all the festivals. They're supposed to do everything in the law just as, as, as Israel did. They take what Jesus said and they say, see, he didn't come to destroy it, so we're supposed to still fulfill it. We're supposed to still live it. But you know what they forget? They forget the other part where he said he came to fulfill it. He came to fulfill the, the, the law and the prophets. Now my question is, whenever that fulfillment came, would there be changes? Of course there would. The priesthood was going to change. Basically, the whole law would change. There was nothing more for uh, uh, fundamental to the whole law than the priesthood. So if the priesthood changed, then guess what? The whole law would change. Again, it goes back to understanding what things mean. And that's, that's you know, that, that, the Hebrew writer here is kind of pinpointing this. He's saying that, that, that the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. What law is he talking about? The law of Moses. Okay? So, again, understanding what Jesus meant, he, he, he didn't come to destroy anything, but he did come to fulfill it. Once it's fulfilled, is there still a need to continue in it? No. It's fulfilled. It served its purpose. And the purpose for which it served is going to last forever. But that doesn't mean that the law itself lasts forever or that every part of it is going to last forever. And so that's, that's basically what the Hebrew writer is here saying. Now, let's go to verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For he. Who, who's he? It's talking about Jesus. You know, in Psalm 110, 
it was spoken of Jesus as being of the order of Melchizedek. It's talking about the Messiah. It's talking about, uh, you know, it says here he is of another tribe. Which tribe? Well, verse 14 says it. For it's evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Moses never gave, you know, that's interesting. Moses never gave a hint to the Israelites that the Messiah would come from Judah. They didn't know where he was going to come from. He never, he never spoke it. There's more evidence that Jesus could not have been a priest unless, it, unless the priesthood changed. Because the priesthood under the Jews had to come through who? Levi. So for him, for it to be spoken of that he would be a priest forever under the order of Melchizedek, and that he would even be a priest, that right there indicates the priesthood was going to have to change. The priesthood that was existing in the Old Testament and that existed all the way up to when this Hebrew writer was writing, that priesthood was not going to last. And so they had to, to understand that. And, and he again, he's building this foundation of who Jesus was. Or I should say, who Melchizedek was. Now, let's read verse 15. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law, of a fleshly commandment. What commandment? The commandment that, there, that the priest would come from the tribe of Levi and they would be of, the, of, of Aaron's sons. But according to the power of an endless life. Now that's, that's beautiful. Because basically what it's saying here is um, that this priest, the one that would last forever, it's not coming from any hereditary succession. The power, his power is not coming. Because even in the nation of Israel, you know, they had priests who were good and they had priests who were bad. They didn't always have a good priest, a high priest. They didn't always have good priests. But because they were of the right blood, guess what? They got the job. This priest, gets his power from the fact that he's eternal. That he has endless life. And that's what the Hebrew writer is saying here. He's come not according to the law of fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, Psalm 110 verse 4. Uh, verse 18 for on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. It's basically saying something is going out, and guess what? Something is now going to be coming in. By bringing in the priesthood of Melchizedek, we are taking out the Aaronic priesthood. Uh, by bringing in this new priesthood, we have a better hope. Why do we have a better hope? We have a hope of an endless life because we have a priest who will never die. Again, there was a reason for the priesthood to change, and this is why. We had to have a different priesthood. And that's what the Hebrew writer under inspiration of, of, of the Spirit is explaining to us here. Let's continue on reading. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. You know, it's interesting. We are already beginning to see just in these few verses that this priesthood that we are under now 
the order of Melchizedek, it's better than anything Israel ever had. Because it's a better priesthood because it represents a better covenant. And next week when we get into chapter 8, we're going to talk about this better covenant even more. Um, but back in chapter 6, what we discussed a week or two ago, uh, the Hebrew writer talked about, remember the two immutable things? God made a, a you know, it's impossible for him to lie, and, and this priesthood is better uh, because of two immutable things. Number one, the promise. Number two, he made an oath. God didn't make the priest swear. They, didn't, they weren't under oath. He didn't give them an oath. And he didn't make an oath to them in the Old Covenant. They just got their anointed. They were anointed with oil and they became the priest. But there was a, a, an oath made on the priest that we got now. God didn't have to... He, he, he promised it to Abraham, but he swore. He swore. We read it. it. It was quoted there. The Scripture is quoted in this passage of Scripture in verse 21. The Lord has sworn he will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord put his reputation on the line. The God, the Father, put it all out there. And just as his word will is sure, so so it will be. Okay? His God he put his God godliness, his godship on the line, just as he is a God who's faithful and just and pure and righteous, and it's impossible for him to lie, so will this priesthood last forever. The priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. He made an oath on it. Two immutable things, his promise, and then he made an oath. There was never an oath given to the priesthood of Aaron. The, whenever they got uh, anointed to be the priest, they never did an oath themselves. They never were sworn in. But the priest we have now was. And that's why this statement that was made, in, and I believe it's verse 22, this is why it says it. It says, by so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. It's just a, something extra that, that God added uh, to the layer of dignity of the priesthood that we are now under. Something better. And again, going back to the whole theme of the whole book of Hebrews, who is better? Christ. The arrangement of Christ is better. The priesthood is better. The covenant is better. It's better than the angels. It's better than Moses. Better than Joshua. Better than every everything. It's Christ. What we're under now is better because God put more into it. He put more love into it. He put more devotion into it. He put more of His own Word into it. And what He put forward in this is not temporary. It's permanent. Now where I get confused is like the Jewish religion. Now, what happened to that? Well, if you really want to know... I mean, how come they didn't change over? Well, and they... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a categorical statement here. Okay. As a nation, they never will change. No, I and you know why they'll never change? Because Jesus already pronounced judgment on them. In Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See! Your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But it was developed when? In, when we, in 70 AD, their temple was destroyed and they're done. They're done. They're done. Now, individuals out of Israel, out of, Israel. Out of the Jewish system, can become Christian, can become followers of Christ 
and receive all the benefits we have as individuals. But collectively as a nation, as God's chosen people, no, they no longer have that title. In fact, if you really want to understand it, and for anybody that's listening in who might disagree with what I'm saying, you need to study Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Paul very, very clearly describes the relationship that Jews have with Christians and what we are now. He said, not all that were of Israel are of not all that are of Israel are Israel. What he was saying is, just because you're a Jew doesn't mean you're saved now. He said, basically, he said, we are all one vine. You got the remnant of Jews who followed Jesus that is grafted into the Gentiles, and now we are one vine. We're the new Israel. The Jews believe that they're 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 saved. Yeah, and Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims, they do too. <laughs> okay. that one. You know, I mean, Muslims believe in Abraham too, just as we do, you know. But the thing is, we're one vine. The new Israel. We're the spiritual Israel. We're, we're all Israel if we follow Christ. And we're under the new covenant. Okay? So, like I said, there are some, many evangelical Christians think Jews have the same standing as Christians do and that they don't really have to confess Jesus as Lord because they're under the old covenant. Well, we just established the fact in what we read tonight in Hebrews chapter 7, the covenant, the law changed. The priesthood changed. Christ fulfilled it. We're under something new now. And so, like they say, if you wanna, if you wanna, you got to get with the program, right? They did. You got to get with the new program if you're gonna be on the, you know, on, on the on the road to life with Christ. And the only way to get to the Father is not through Moses. What does the Bible say? The only way to get to the Father is through Jesus. Not through Muhammad. Not through Moses. Not through any other deity. Only through Jesus. And so, yes, for, for Jews that become followers of Christ, you know, uh, Revelation talks about the first fruits, and even in the book of James it talks about the first fruits of the church. I think the first fruits, the ones that are around the throne of God, are those Jews in the first century who became followers of Christ. They're right there. They were the first ones. Every follower of Christ in the first century was a, was a former Jew. Right, uh -huh. they're right around the throne with, 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 with you know, they're they're right there. They're the first. But the the remnant of those Jews that followed Christ have now grafted in with the Gentiles, and we're all one vine. So really, God's chosen people is not necessarily a geographic nation. It's not Israel. It's not the United States. It's not somewhere geographical. Rather, it's the church, which is made up of people from all parts of the of the world, all over the earth. We're all we're all the the body of Christ. We're His chosen people, and of course, the first fruits would be the the remnant of the Jews who accepted Christ. And so that's that's how that works. And it's a good question because it goes right hand in hand with what we're studying here in understanding how this all worked out because the Hebrew writer is explaining this because he's talking to the first fruits. Right. Everyone he's talking to was Hebrew Christians who had left the Judaic system and were now Christians. And he's letting them know what you're in now is better than what you had. Don't go back to it. Stay in what you're in. And that's what he was trying to tell them. Got it. Now let's conclude this. I believe the last thing we... Let me read it, verse 23 through 25. Also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. We know what that... That's self-explanatory. In Aaron's priesthood, the priest died. You had a good priest. He was interceding for you. 
and you went to him, and and every year he he made if the high priest if it was if you were close to him and he was doing the atonement, guess what? He might die before you. And you know what's interesting about the Aramaic priest? They had to do something extra that Jesus never has to do. You know what they had to do? Before the priest could make an offering for you, Carol, guess what they had to do? They had to make an offering for their own sins first to even be qualified to make an offering for yours. If, if, if they did it like one time, like in morning, for example, and then do the, because they had a whole bunch of sacrifices. Yes. They did it in the morning. Now, granted, if they if they sinned in the, in the middle of the day, and they did something stupid, <coughs> then they probably had to do another offering for themselves before they could uh, proceed with all, making offerings. Okay? Our Jesus, our priest, he never has to do that step. He doesn't have to say, oh, uh-oh, let me, go, let, let me go get on the cross real quick before I, you know, intercede for Carol or... Kyle or must you know uh, Jay, you know I need I need to make an offering for no why it's perfect he's sinless we're going to talk about that in a minute and he of course he doesn't die we don't have to worry about a good priest dying he, because it says here there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing but he because he continues forever has an unchangeable priesthood. No, so now it's not the brother or the, it doesn't go in the family, you, you know, and then, and you, you're born into that line. Right. No more. Exactly. Our high priest is Jesus. He's the mediator between you and the Father. It's not any man on earth. Right. Okay? And, and that, that kind of goes along with you know, you got these quote unquote family churches right. where the same family has ran a church for five generations. Right. Great 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 grandpa started it, then great great grandpa took it over, then great great grand and now here the fifth generation is still running it. Like like okay, it's handed to you, like there's a succession. If you were good one. Yeah. He's a he's a, he's a son of the the, the right. From his yeah, you're father. right. Yeah, exactly. His father started it, and now he's over it. I, I mean, yeah, I, God can call families to, into ministry. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that it can't happen. But it kind of goes along. It, they kind of have the mentality of this priesthood thing where it has to go to my son. Yeah. Well, God may not use your son the same way he used you, and your church might suffer because of it. Right? Just like Israel suffered when they had a bad priest, a high priest. They didn't always have a good high priest. And so I think you kind of, it's better. What we have now is better because Jesus, he's the better priest. Right now, there is no succession. We don't have to worry about anything changing. We don't have to worry about something, you know, a new administration. Jesus is it. And that's why he's better. Now, I want to make a point. This goes back to our whole first argument of what this whole chapter was about. Remember, we established that Melchizedek was who? Well, I think he was, was the Word. I think he was Jesus. He wasn't called Jesus then, of course, but that's who he was. If Melchizedek was just some man, all this stuff that we've been reading about his priesthood not changing, not dying, his priesthood being continually, guess what? Let's say Melchizedek was a man and he died. And then, you know, 4,000 years later, 3,000 years later, Jesus comes and he takes over. Well, guess what? That is no different than, than Aaron. It's no different than Aaron. Absolutely no different than the Aaronic priesthood. It says here that this is unchangeable. There is no change in the priesthood. 
And so, again, I think this is proof that Melchizedek and Jesus have, have to be one and the same. Okay? Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Save to the uttermost. I think it was, uh, who was it? D.L. Moody? Many of you may be familiar with him. He used to say he, uh, let me see if I can find it. I think I wrote it down. Save to the uttermost. He, he used to say, Jesus does, does that. He saves to the uttermost. Not just to the uttermost, but even to the guttermost. Isn't that beautiful? He saves to the uttermost, to the guttermost. We're, we're live. That's okay. He saves to the uttermost, all the way to the guttermost. That is so, so true. And what that means is, our experience in salvation, we're going to end this up real quickly here. Our experience with salvation is not just a one-time event. Jesus is going to keep saving us until we're saved. We come to Him, we know Him, He changes us, we're born again, and we're progressively sanctified. We, we walk in Christ. We make, we, we make, you know, we might take a few steps back and then we go forward. We make mistakes, we might backtrack some, but he continues to guide us along the way until finally we get to the point where we are saved. We're completely saved. We're saved, as it says here, to the uttermost. And that's what Jesus does. Unlike that priest that we talked about before, who you might have a good priest that you used to have when you were back in the Jewish system, and then you, boy, you, I like this priest. He really makes, I, I can go make my offerings to him and I feel good and he encourages me. And then you find out the next day, oh, the priest died. He's gone. Oh, now I got to, oh, now the one that's over our tribe, I have to get another, I got uh, over our family, I've got, we've got to get another priest. And you might not like the next one. Jesus doesn't do that. We have the same high priest. It does not change. He does not change. We, we, we continue to make progress in our Christian walk and He guides us and, 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 and deals with us and encourages us and loves us and pulls us back in when we need it. And, and sometimes He chastens us because we need that too, but, but he, He's unchangeable. And that's what makes His priesthood so much better. And that, that's, that's what is saying here. He saves to the uttermost. Okay? Let, let's read these last few verses and we'll close out. <clears throat> for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness, but the word of the oath, that's the oath that was get, that the, the Lord made that his priesthood would last according to the order of Melchizedek forever, which came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected forever. There's just a few points I want to point out here. He's holy, he's harmless, undefiled, Separate from sinners. This part right here, separate from sinners. That doesn't mean geographically separate from sinners. Okay? Oh, well, he's way up here. Now, now physically, he is separate from sinners, because now he's in heaven. But when he was on earth, he was amongst the sinners. But he was sinless. Yes. He was. He wined and dined with them. He was, he was just like that rock I talked about in Sunday's message. It's yeah. in the river... But when you break it open, it's still dry. He was in the world, but the world none of the world was in him. All right, that was Jesus. But he connected to sinners. He came to save the sinners. He didn't come to condemn them. He came to save them. So him being separate from sinners does not mean he was 
so much elevated above them or looked down on them. No, when it says he, he was separate from sinners, is he was separate in the fact that he walked on a different plane. Okay? He was amongst them, but he walked on a different plane. He didn't have their mind. He didn't think like they thought. He didn't try to scheme like they, they schemed. He didn't try to manipulate like they manipulate. He was on a different plane. And because he was all of these wonderful things, he was harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, now he's higher than the heavens. He is physically away from all sin, but he still is knocking at the door of that sinner's heart today. Because he, it's his desire that all be saved. And as we exactly now, as it as we brought out, he doesn't have to go and offer up sins for himself before he intercedes. Before he goes and and, and goes to the Father and says, "Father, I paid for them. I paid for them. My blood was poured for them. Forgive them." Right. He, he, he doesn't have to go and make up his own offerings before because he has to correct something. Now, it does say here that, that uh, for the law appoints his high priest men who have weakness. Now, I will say there were times when Jesus was weak physically. But I think what this is talking about is weakness is not talking about physically weak. It's talking about moral weakness. The high priest of Israel, the Levitical priest of Israel, they were morally weak at times. They sinned. They made mistakes. They were corrupt. Some of them were dishonest. Okay? But our Jesus has never been morally weak. Even hanging on the cross and suffering, he could not be morally weak. He could not curse anyone. He could not say an evil against anyone. The same people who crucified him, he said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's right. Yes. He had moments of weakness. He was tired. He was thirsty. He was frustrated. He was sad. He got righteously indignant on at least two occasions. Okay? He had, he had moments where he was weak, but morally and doing the right thing, absolutely not. And that's why he's qualified to be our high priest today. He, there's no one like him. And we definitely have a better high priest. And, and, and here, what's, like I said earlier, what sealed the deal in his priesthood was the fact he is the only priest that has, that has ever represented the true God who got sworn upon sworn. An oath was sworn upon him. There was no such thing in Israel because all that, all, you had to just be of the right blood to be, right. to be a priest in Israel. You were of Aaron's line. You were of the tribe of Levi. And it was your blood that sealed the deal for you. Who you were. No. This right here was an oath that Almighty God made the, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And he the so an, a, an oath was sworn upon him. And so, as we mentioned in everything that we just went over and as we <coughs> did this expository over this chapter, Hebrews chapter 7, if Melchizedek was just a regular man, if he was Shem, if he was, then, then there's something more about this man if he's just a man. Because the verbiage that we read, the things that we looked at, the context that we look at, there, that to me there's no question that Melchizedek was an example that we have in Scripture of a theophany. Where... The pre-incarnated Jesus appeared as a man. Because it's just too it's there's just too much there that that, that that writer that's what that writer felt. Now there's theologians today that don't agree with that, but when a Bible writer himself is agreeing to it, 
as we look at each of those verses. Uh, and, and if that writer is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I think God is telling us something. And the writer was? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know the writer of Hebrews. Okay. We think Paul had something to do with it, but it very well could have been Luke or Silas that assisted him with it. But we don't, there's no, there's no solid evidence today of who wrote the book of Hebrews. So with Paul, we think maybe. The only thing about Paul being doing it by himself, when you look at the other books of the Bible that Paul wrote, the verbiage and the way that Paul spoke and the way that he wrote does not match up to Hebrews. You know, everybody has their own style. Right. Right? And when you compare the the, the writings, it looks like two different people wrote it. Yeah. So Paul may have... Some of the knowledge that was put in the book of Hebrews may have yeah. came from Paul but as he was it. relating it to someone, and then someone else may have penned it for him. In their writing. Right. right. Could have been Silas. It could have been Luke. It could have been a number of people. So, anyway, that's that's all we're going to say tonight on this. That was a lot. We did a whole chapter in, in one week. Hallelujah. Yeah. How often do we get that far? I don't know. But I because all of this was in the same subject, I didn't want to split it up. I, we needed to hit it all at one time and just, boom, get it over with. And I hope everyone uh, was informed by it. You can go back and look at it. It's some amazing. I love the book of Hebrews. You too. We're going to close with a word of prayer. And then Miss Carol here, for all those listening in, has a birthday. And we're going to cut a cake and get fat. <laughs> Our Father in Heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to, to, uh, to celebrate not just this lady's birthday here, but to celebrate your word. Yes. As we go into your word, we understand it, we expound on it, and boy, your, your, your word just opens up to us we see things we never saw before and we're just encouraged to know the depth and the riches of your word i pray father that this word will inspire us father to get us excited to get us moving there's so many things in this world right now that's bringing us down this depressing us and causing us stress but father when we get into your word and we see it it, it excites us and Father, that's what we need more of right now. We need excitement in good things, not bad things. So Father, we just pray that you, you, you allow us to get into this word more, to understand it, to put it together, and to really benefit by it. Father, I, I lift up uh, uh, this world right now into your care, particularly our country. Uh, we're, we're under attack in many ways, and, and I'm praying, Father, that you will bless us and help us we don't know if Jesus is about to crack that sky or not. Uh, the signs of the times look so. But, Father, we just want to be faithful in, in, in our work. And, and we're praying, Father, that you will continue to protect us uh, until, until that day that we're called home. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.